Uh, welcome to Darien Library. Thanks so much for coming out this evening. It's such a shame that the Pattern Nitty family has not been more friendly throughout their lives. <laughs> Maybe then we would have gotten a crowd tonight. Um, I'm so pleased to see you all here, and I know that the entire library family is very pleased to see you out as well. Uh, I'd like to just briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs like these available to our community. And I would also like to thank Fairfield Cheese Shop and Laura in particular. We really put her through the ringer tonight and she did not have her business partner with her, so we're very grateful to her. Tonight's guest has had writing appear in publications including the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, Harper's Outside, Esquire, and GQ, where he works as a correspondent. He is the recipient of an NEA grant and two McDowell fellowships. His first book, Driving Mr. Albert, was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. And I just found out tonight that the telling room is number 21 on the New York Times bestsellers list. <laughs> But what you may not know is that to be considered a New York Times bestseller, it has to make it to number 15. So Barrett Bookstore is here to sell the books <laughs> so that we can bump it up because we want it to be number 15 next week or even higher. 14. 14 sounds great too. <laughs> so the book that our guest is here to talk about tonight is called The Telling Room. It begins in the fall of 1991 at Zingerman's Deli in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where our author encountered a piece of cheese. This was not just any piece of cheese, though. This was Paramo de Guzman. You'll probably pronounce it much better than I can. A rare Spanish queso, which, according to the deli's newsletter, was one of the most sought-after delicacies on Earth. It was prepared by being submerged in olive oil and aged for a year in a cave, which is known as a telling room. This is where it gained magical qualities. If you ate it, some said you might recover long-lost memories. So, in the summer of 2000, tonight's guest decided to pursue this piece of cheese by traveling to the picturesque Castilian village of Guzman, which you saw some photos in the slideshow as we were eating our cheese. But this story is so much more than cheese, as the people who have read it know. And our guest is so much more than the accolades that I previously mentioned. Uh, I'm guessing that most of you probably know this, but his mom, Marianne, happens to work at the library. <laughs> and our guest is from Darien and grew up here. And we had so many people coming into the library and taking a look at the poster and saying like, oh, that book looks good. And then they'd come back and they'd look again. And they'd be like, wait, is is that our mic? <laughs> so your French teacher did that, by the way. <laughs> your high school French teacher. <laughs> he is joining us tonight from Portland, Maine, where he lives with his wife, Sarah, and their three children. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Mr. Mike Paternitti. All right, this is awesome. This is great. Um, I had more hair um, last time I was here, so maybe that's why people didn't recognize the, the picture outside. Um, I have to say, because I don't get to um, stand at the Darien Library like this very often, usually I've got some hooded sweatshirt on and I'm buried in a stack somewhere looking dangerous and potentially homeless. Um, that this is, this is really the most magical place. Um, greatest library in America, hands down. And um, I really, like one of my, my very first memories um, as a kid was at the old library, being in the kids section, and um, just being in love with this one book called um, Randy's Dandy's Lions. Uh, and it was about a hapless lion trainer and the uh, hijinks he got into with his highly lethal animals. Um, but I, rem I just remember like opening that book, I remember the smell of that book, and I remember thinking, um, what, like, what is it 
that these like markings on a page, why is it these markings on a page have all this energy and all this story and all this movement and uh, all these characters coming to life? Um, so I think really that was maybe the first inklings um, I had of my own fascination with words and stories. Um, and I, w I want to thank the Darien Library for having me and also for letting me take out books endlessly here. Um, they fueled a lot of research uh, that went into this book. Um, also, this book is dedicated to my parents. And since I'm here, I want to thank both of them. Um, I love you guys. And they, in, in a very major way, um, carried me through big parts of this book. They'd come up to Maine and hang out with the kids. And you know there were just a lot of hurdles along the way. So um, I'm deeply <coughs> indebted. Um, OK. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you heard a little bit about how it began. Um, when I, myself, was a hapless uh, grad student in Ann Arbor <coughs> in 1991. And I was there to study fiction. Um, I had no money, um, and I was trying to pick up some extra money. So I went to this incredible deli in Ann Arbor called Zingerman's. Um, I don't know if anyone has been to Ann Arbor or been to Zingerman's. I, like a truly incredible place. It's like a foodie's paradise. And, and one of the owners, Ari, um, would sort of travel around the world and bring back all these delicacies, like Finnish licorice and uh, sherry vinegars from um, you know, the south of Spain, and he just, he was a collector of these magical foods that had stories. And I remember uh, in 1991, in the October newsletter that he wrote, he wrote this newsletter, and, and people were fanatical for this newsletter. It was like reading The New Yorker for, for the, the Cognoscente in Ann Arbor. They wanted to hear of Ari's latest adventures. And in this newsletter, um, there was this entry about um, this cheese from Spain, uh, Paramo de Guzman, which is, that's the extent of my Spanish. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, the little entry was, it was like the beginning of a fairy tale. It was, it was, um, it was really like once upon a time there was a piece of cheese. There's, the guy's name was Ambrosio, um, which seemed impossible. Uh, he had this old family recipe that he'd recovered. Um, it was said to be a magical cheese, which seemed you know, slightly preposterous. And yet, I, I, w I wanted to believe that with my whole heart, of course. Um, and he was um, really uh, committed to the old ways. He did everything the old way. So it was, it was this, he had this sort of um, slow food ethos before slow food became fashionable. Um, flash forward about 10 years, I'm a magazine journalist. Um, I did, before I left, I, I ripped that entry, for some reason, I don't even really remember why, I ripped the entry out of the newsletter and I kind of stuck it in my wallet. So eventually I put it in a file, but then 10 years later I was going to Spain. I was going to profile um, this futurist chef named Fran Adria, who um, basically was reinventing cuisine as we know it. He was serving these like asparagus foams and <laughs> orange worms that tasted like, you know, steak tartare. <laughs> I mean, it was like really um, crazy stuff. And he was, he was um, leaning into the future. He was obsessed with how to redefine food as we know it. And I had a, had a day off on a Sunday. My buddy Carlos was with me. And I had this um, entry from this newsletter from 10 years earlier. And I took myself up to this little village in Castile, in the north central part of Spain, um, two and a half hours north of Madrid. And Carlos and I came into this little village of 80 people called Guzman. Um, and you guys were seeing some pictures from there. Very isolated. It's very much like, um, sort of like South Dakota. Uh, just very, very desolate. And then you come upon these villages, and, and all the houses are packed, you know, they're all packed together. And, um, and in this village, there were 80 people. They all seemed to be about 80 years old. Uh, and, and we asked to see Ambrosio. And Ambrosio was, um, he was 
we had a call just ahead, and he said, you'll find me in the village. So we were, we, we found um, these caves that are on the north side of the town. And these were the caves where they used to store the food before, refer, uh, before refrigeration. And in these caves, they built these little rooms over time called telling rooms. And these rooms had like, a, they had a table and fireplace, and people would get, gather to tell their stories and eat food and share their um, dreams and their secrets and histories. So we, uh, we found some, some, a group of old people who were drinking from um, their paron, which is a, uh, sort of a decanter with a spout on it. And you go like this with the wine, uh, and you arc it into your mouth. So the first act of greeting in a village like this is you, that you drink from the paron. So, um, I, of course, had it, well, I looked like I'd been shot. I was, I had it all over my shirt. And, uh, and so they said, yeah, Ambrosio's cave is next door. So I knock on the door and Ambrosio answers. And he says, you know, you look like you've been shot, hombre. Um, but so began this, this, this time with him, which ended up being 13 years. Um, I saw him a month ago. And in the course of this time together, but really on that first night, over eight hours, he told this incredible tale, and I just wanted to try his cheese. That's all I was really there for. Um, I just thought it was in and out, you know, the American sort of drive through McDonald's way. Um, but he really told this unbelievable, mesmerizing tale, and he is this 260 pound force of nature. He is the greatest storyteller I've ever met in my travels out in the world, and um, he is body and irreverent, very funny, he can be very emotional. Um, and really what every story goes back to is um, the old way of living, the, the simple way, um, the slow, sort of beautiful way. And of course, for somebody living at the digital speed of American life, um, that was really enticing, like almost immediately. Um, I was like, how can I get me some more of this stuff? You know, like it was really, um, it was like a spell that was cast. He did not, though, as the story unfolded, have any more of this cheese. He wasn't making it anymore. Um, and so he then told me that he had, as this cheese uh, became bigger and had a bigger audience um, and had been passed from the village, um, hand to hand to other villages, he had um, watched the meteoric rise of this. It got, it actually got passed um, to three villages over, and a cheesemonger from Madrid came up and took the cheese back to Madrid, and somehow uh, the king and queen of Spain ate the cheese, and um, they said, "This is incredible." Um, it reminded them of an old cheese. Uh, like it did everybody else. Everybody was reminded of the days when, like, their mother was in the kitchen with these house, you know, these homemade cheeses, these old cheeses. Um, so, people not only love the taste, but they love what what the cheese evoked, this purity, this lost era. And um, the king and queen of Spain allegedly passed it on to um, to the British royal family, and they got really excited about the cheese. <laughs> and. Um, then it got given to um, Ronald Reagan and Frank Sinatra, two uh, you know, famous cheese hounds. And then Fidel Castro wanted to buy all of Ambrosio's cheese. So this, this cheese like, became world famous. And um, this was just a farmer. This guy was, um, had no business instinct whatsoever. But he did have a best friend and a blood brother named Julian. And Julian was a lawyer. And Julian was very smart and very good at business. And on this night um, that ended at 2 a.m. in the morning, Ambrosio told the story of how Julian um, had put, would put contracts in front of him and he would sign them. And uh, he signed at some point a contract that signed away this cheese. And um, when he realized it, he um, began to plot to kill Julian. <laughs> So I was just there for the cheese. Um, and suddenly I've, I felt like I, the first question actually when we left that I asked Carlos is like, 
what are, what's our exposure here? Like, are we accomplices now that we know the plot? Like, if he kills them, are we going to jail too? Um, but um, but one of the one of the things I remember as we drove away was knowing um, that I had to come back. So, but what I did was on on um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just a few little short things, and then we'll hopefully do a little Q&A. So I'm not going to um, go on and on here. But I want to read to you um, from when I first came back from Guzman and um, this idea of, of this place having a complete um, hold on me and this desire to um, somehow escape the life I was living. Um, if I can find it, <laughs> this is this is one of the problems with with my book is I've um, I've read it so many times that it doesn't go in order anymore. It's all <laughs> it's all jumbled. Um, okay. Upon my return home, I pinned a photograph to the wall by my desk in the attic, and then carried on again, living in the clips, in the interstices, on the go, on the run, on the flyover in rental cars, on takeout, during commercial breaks, between appointments and dirty diapers and ringing phones, adrenaline begetting adrenaline, packing bags and passport, on hold because of bad weather, de-icing, taking off, gathering speed on the clover leaf, missing connections, missing my wife and son, checking in and out, mentally filibust filibustering until the deadline had passed and it was time to pull an all-nighter to get something done. Why was one always behind, and how did one get ahead? Of course, the photograph of Ambrosio, though it could have been from 100 years ago, the, the photograph was of Ambrosio, though it could have been from 100 years ago. During our visit, he led me down 13 steps beneath the telling room, and I recalled Ari's line from that old Zingerman's newsletter, the cheese is taken and aged in a cave one that had stuck because it seemed most folkloric, folkloric of all. I'd had visions of a gaping maw surrounded by boulders wafting forth fragrant cheese, or perhaps cathedrals of cobwebs, bats hanging upside down from stalactites, albino salamanders, the echoing drip drop of an underground pool. Instead, it was a close, tight space, maybe 30 by 15 feet, clean, dry, and well ventilated, with a PVC pipe running to the surface for air. The floor and walls were stone, and several electric bulbs hung from the ceiling. After that oppressive summer heat, it had been surprisingly cool down there, too, air conditioned by nature, as Ambrosio had it. Along one wall was makeshift wooden shelving where the cheese had once been kept. Now the planks sat empty. Back in the left corner was a cubby with more rickety shelves where the family stored its homemade wine in unlabeled green bottles. Even as Ambrosio talked on and on, he ducked into the corner, rummaged a little, and returned with an old wooden box. He unclasped its hook, reached in, and lifted out something wrapped in chamois, one white tin emblazoned with, a black, with black script and a gold medal of the original Paramo de Guzman, all that remained of Ambrosio's grand experiment, one tin. I asked if he'd let me take a picture. He pulled a wooden chair into the middle of the cave and sat, holding the tin in one hand and the oversized key to the bodega in the other. The bodega is the cave and the telling room. Framed by the rock walls, he gazed directly into the camera, conveying measures of pride and mournfulness, nonchalance and seriousness. But there was no doubt. Here was a human being concentrated in the moment with an elemental kind of weight and grace. In explaining the cave's former function as a storehouse, Ambrosio had conjured the old Castilian again, the one who had planted and scythed wheat by hand, who had made the casks for carrying wine out of the hardened bodies of cured goats. The goat casks were then carried up to the caves on the shoulders of field hands to the Song of Hotas, where a man sat in El Contador, counting everything brought from the field. In Spanish, the telling room is El Contador. Originally, it was a counting room. They would count what went into the cave. In that day, the field hands had worked for the Lord, the man named Guzman, who lived in the palace, and one imagined received the tallies of the day. Meanwhile, there I sat in my attic, tallying, words on the page, hours until deadline, 
the age, I would be made a grandfather if optimistically Leo had a child of his own at the age of 30, um, which was the age of 66, I had figured. Um, I sat attached to my machines, typing to keep my editors at bay, staring at the photograph of Ambrosio day after day. What was it I saw in him? Freedom, guidance, a simple life? He was a link to the past in a digitized time when the past had become somewhat irrelevant. Ambrosio had defined this phenomenon by a phrase. He called it the disability of memory, which he felt was the blight of modern man, and which I took to be the blight of me. But what did it mean? Everyone is rushing forward, he said, so I must go back. That's what the photograph was trying to say to me, too. I must go back. Um, and so I did. And I, and I did again and again. And I went back uh, to, I think I had this fantasy that maybe I'd have this piece of cheese, um, the only one left. But I knew that wasn't going to happen, probably. <laughs> Um, and then I, I got very interested in whether Ambrosio was, in fact, going to murder his best friend. Um, and I forgot about my legal exposure and just got sucked in. Um, but I also got sucked into the village and all the amazing stories that got told in the village. It was, um, it was like a Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel. Everything was magical realism. There was a man named Manuel who everybody knew. Uh, they said he flew. At night, in fact, in the um, there's a map, and up in the corner is Manuel flying, and um, and I saw Ambrosio, um, like I said a month ago, and I showed him the map, and he looked at it, and he's like, that doesn't look. Manuel's much fatter than that. <laughs> I, was, I was like, yeah, but he's flying. Is that does it? Does he really fly like that? And everyone's shaking their head. Yeah, but it doesn't look like him. Um, <laughs> So, so there were all these amazing stories um, that I found myself falling into. I found myself in the telling room listening to these stories. And when Ambrosio told these stories, I was like that kid again, you know, reading Randy's Dandy's Lion or something. It just the stories held me in this place that was timeless. Um, but there, were, but so I returned. The, our family returned um, in the summer of 2003. We all went over. Um, we went back afterwards for, for other visits, but um, I did want to read a little, just a little part about um, this murder plot of his. Uh, he was studying uh, military manuals, and he, he, admitted that, he admitted that when this happened, he went into his sort of crazy, he called it his crazy nightmare brain. Um, so this was... This was sort of a compulsion that lasted for a long time. And he wasn't sure what he was going to do with it. But this is, this is how he had planned to um, kill his best friend. Um, this is, so he's, he's, looking at the, he's looking at the military manual. He obsessed in mold, page deeper and slowly a thought dawned on him. He could kill Julian while keeping him alive. After all, there were things he felt he needed to share with him. The scenario he imagined was simple. A rope, knife, and candle in the car. A distant cave. He, cra he craved. <laughs> That's my niece. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my biggest fan. Um, no, she wouldn't be a pattern idiot if she wasn't trying to pull something like that. <laughs> Um, the scenario he imagined was simple. A rope, knife, and candle in the car. A distant cave. He craved revenge that could last in terms that were final. Blood, snot, ligament, bone. He took to the roads in winter after he'd lost the cheese, skimming through the vineyards like a vapor. There were nights when he turned off the headlights and drove by the moon's luster. How many times had he found comfort in the undulating land here, in every bend and rural highway? But in his stricken state, the scene brought him unbearable sadness. A tree with a fallen limb, a gutted car in a field, the old factory with dark windows. The, the cheese had been moved from this little stable across the fields to this stone factory uh, in this village of Roa. The force of projection was too great and gravity too weak. 
he would fry himself by flying headlong into his own black sun. Of course, he knew Julian's every move, exactly where he was at at each hour of the day. Yeah. They'd had telepathy, Ombre. For instance, if they were in a crowded room of people, they might look for each other at the same exact moment. They were the same height, which was a head taller than the rest, and meet eyes and start laughing, laughing at the telepathic joke they told each other over the heads of all the people standing between them who would never know their joke because they didn't possess anything like the telepathy Ambrosio and Julian had, that secret channel. He picked an abandoned bodega, which is a cave, of which there were hundreds in this part of the country. He would turn the engine off, and in the plot he'd concocted, the one he'd fantasized about, he would drag Julian bound and gagged from the trunk of his car into the cave. Killing him with a gunshot or Garrett to the throat would have been an act of cowardice if you really meant to kill your best friend. To change him in death, it should have to be long and slow, thereby providing repeated edification. <laughs> So this is what he, I mean, he literally told us the first night. Um, the moment of truth came. Julian bound tightly in a chair, the knife and candle on the table. Ambrosio would start by leaving him in the dark for a few days to think about things. Then he'd appear with cheese and wine, expansive, jovial, light the candle, drip a bit of wax on the coarse tabletop and prop it there. He wouldn't yell. He wouldn't hit. He'd sit down and eat and drink in front of his good friend, sucking, slurping, masticating, wine dribbling from his lips as Julian sat swollen and parched. And night after night, he would tell him stories, the thousand and one stories of our friendship, as Ambrosio had put it. Do you remember the first merienda at the bodega? We stole the wine, just the four musketeers, right? Can you picture Enrique's face when he was still alive? And do you remember the, the story we told that night about the witches of Peña Fiel? The stories would unfold in slow motion. He would tease out this intricate detail, that funny strain. He would make beautiful origami out of memory, out of innocent tales of childhood, and then hang it there from the cave ceiling. Afterward, he would dispense with the niceties and let his mood swing to the affliction of his mind. He would approach Julian, picking the knife from the table. In one motion, he'd slice an earlobe. To stanch the blood, he'd cauterize the wound with the lit candle. It was so easy the way you could begin to edit and delete a body. They were, so, they were so far from civilization, the screaming merely sounded like the wind. But even that didn't feel like enough. He wanted to give more by taking more. He would tell the story for each amputation. He had so much to give. Do you remember the fiesta? Do you remember the girls at the Burgos dance? He needed Julian to live in order that he might understand what Ambrosio meant by the disability of memory. He wanted Julian to live forever in order to remember how it had once been when they were young and innocent and most alive. He would bring Julian to a place where there was no such thing as time. Night after night, Julian heard the stories and songs. Even in his diminishment, he still clung to life to the sound of Ambrosio's voice. But Ambrosio couldn't keep him alive forever. He knew there'd come a night when Julian would remain motionless. Perhaps Ambrosio who could be moved to tears by an old dog with a limp or a young child with his hair parted just so would feel nothing except a final flash of anger. Puta madre, it seemed this brother of his, Julian, was for the moment dead. So that's the, that's what drove, <laughs> that's what drove this guy. Um, and I'm going to read one little other part. Um, this is, this is, um, we can, we, <coughs> This book is a, sort of ends up being a narrative war. Ambrosio told me a legend that I really desperately wanted to believe and that I believed for many years um, and that I clung to. Um, and at some point, in order to tell a story, the storyteller has to take the story back. Um, and so Ambrosio and I engaged in uh, uh, a dance of sorts in which I became very uh, sort, sort of more and more implicated in these machinations between him and Julian. Um, but the end of this legend uh, came at the end of the summer that we spent together. He had this one tin of cheese in the cave. And uh, this was in September. We were leaving um, that week. And he invited us up to the telling room. And he had his friends um, were all these amazing farmers who all um, were, had no teeth. And um, they were hilarious people. Um, and they were often very um, drunk and uh, <laughs> often eating sheep ears, you know, which is a delicacy. So 
we wa our little family walked in that, that summer. It was um, my son was three, and we had my daughter was one. We hadn't had our third child, and um, we walked in, and I immediately was seated at the table with all the all the farmers um, because they sort of saw me as one of them, and I was really trying to be one of them. Uh, I was I would harvest with them sometimes and do manly things, um, which I was <laughs> completely incapable of doing. Um, and uh, so I sat down, and they had this this uh, plate full of sheep ears, uh, which are disgusting. You know, they're not they're not good um, to eat. They take a long time to eat, and they're very chewy. And I I got through my three, um, and they ladled four more onto my plate. <laughs> and uh, so I did I I did what you know you sometimes do, where my wife Sarah was across the room, and um, I started motioning like. Uh, I think May's diaper is dirty. I think it's. I think I'm gonna go take care of that. And she's she like, her diaper's not dirty. <laughs> uh, I was like, no, it's dirty. It's definitely dirty. Um, so I stepped out of the telling room, out, out of the bodega, and um, and I was outside for a while, uh, trying to just sort of recover and digest. And um, and I came back into the telling room. And when I came back in, Ambrosio was. Um, he was sort of across the way and he had his back to the door and he was sort of hovering over something and Sarah was like, come here, you gotta check this out. And um, he had gone down into the cave and Paramo de Guzman is, is packaged in a white tin and uh, he had opened it and put it over this flame and it, and it was, um, as you heard in the introduction, drenched in olive oil. So the olive oil was bubbling, the cheese was sort of sweating and um, and after a certain amount of time, he sliced two pieces from it and handed it to um, Sarah and, and myself. And so this is the moment where this legend sort of ended. This is where Ambrosio gave me my little happy ending. Um, but there's, there was still another uh, you know, 100, 120 pages left after this. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read it to you from this. So I, just, I had just put the cheese in my mouth. How do you begin to describe a moment for which you've waited a small eternity, thinking it was never to be? How do you downplay such a consummation? Inside, I was turning cartwheels, doing the Watusi, soft-shoeing with a vaudeville smile, while outside, my ersatz Castilian stoicism crumbled. Wow, 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 I repeated as Ambrosia watched and grinned, saying nothing. Oh, it was a strong cheese. A Herculean cheese, you could tell that immediately. Tangy and tart, melting and then flaring again. With the, with the first crumble, it spread slowly in lava flow across the palatal landscape, tasting of minerals and luscious buttercream, of caramel and chamomile and thyme. It tasted of flour and dirt, manure and nectar, and perhaps of love and hate, too. A gustatory alert went up, and my whole mouth was watering and alive, awakened from Van Winkle's slumber and emergency ready. This was a cheese that, like its master, sharply caught you unawares, lovingly provoked you while assuming your submission, and then its richness overwhelmed all previous thoughts, tastes, memories. I now understood vaguely how the cheese might have created a conduit to the past, for its concentration was a force, an energy, a momentum, the psychic drill bit boring a wormhole in this Castilian space-time continuum. I had no past with this cheese. My past lay in those individually wrapped slices of processed Kraft American cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or cheese so alien that it was spelled C-H-E-E-Z. <laughs> cheese whiz, cheese doodles, cheez-its. Fromage facsimiles that conjured school lunches in our 70s suburban kitchen, my mom flipping grilled cheese sandwiches, punching open can after can of high C for my brothers and me until our purple-orange mustaches glowed with a sharpie permanence. <laughs> Eating Paramo de Guzman now, I realized that this was the memory, that I was having the memory as I was making the memory, that this cheese could compress time. And yet it was just cheese, right? So what was it that I tasted now? Ambrosio leaned over and dropped the plate on the table among the chattering men. 
who reached out greedily and grabbed what there was to grab. Had anyone asked, he might have said, oh, that? That's just some old cheese we had lying about. But no one bothered. They gobbled the slices, carrying on as they did, not once remarking on what they ate. Perhaps Ambrosio would have had it, wouldn't have had it any other way. It seemed like an age-old Castilian transaction, homemade food delivered to guests like the sharing of family wine. But with wine also came conversation about the wine, and debate about the wine, and expositions about the wine, <coughs> histories and tall tales and smack talk. And here with Ambrosio's cheese, there was none of that. What didn't occur to me at the time, and what never crossed my mind, in fact, was that perhaps the event was significant only for us. That maybe we'd made the cheese mythic, or I had, sucking in everyone behind me. And Ambrosio, flattered as anyone might be by an interested visitor, and gifted in the art of myth-making himself, had gone right along with me, pumping helium into my balloon while I ran around urging everyone to look at the beautiful balloon. Meanwhile, the men in the room took the cheese for what it was, cheese. Besides, why would they willingly revisit Ambrosio's bad luck with it? And yet here were Sarah and I, transfixed and under a late summer spell, now with a second piece of the original Paramo de Guzman in our mouths, tasting the specific land and animals from 10 years earlier, the chura sheep grazing in the barcos, the essence of a lost place unlocked for us by Ambrosio, the giant on his witness hill. What did the cheese taste like? I'd like to pretend it tasted like love or history or God, if those things possess a real taste, that its molecules reshaped my own and created a flash of insight but you know, it tasted like really good cheese. <laughs> Sublime cheese, though in this context, it didn't matter what the cheese tasted like. The children cooed and squawked. We were bursting with gratitude. Ambrosio placed the last slices on the table. And one by one, the men with hairy fingers and raspy laughter picked them from the plate and popped them thoughtlessly into their mouths until the much heralded and ballyhooed Paramo de Guzman cheese was gone forever. Thank you. So I don't know if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer a few. Well, first let me say I read your book quite beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does Ari Zingerman know you wrote a book mentioning him at the beginning? I, I spent five days with Ari last ah, week. Were you at the cheese? Uh, at the, at the cheese yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, he does. The book was at the conference book store. So I was like, oh, I'm going there. <laughs> so, yeah, he does. Yeah, it's I'll awesome. I'll answer that for you, sorry. No, no, it's great. I, I, yes, Ari, Ari. So I, when I was in Ann Arbor, Ari always would come through, and he was dressed in his like lycra running outfit. He looked like the lead singer for Lover Boy. He had like a bandana on, and he was, it, but he was like the sex symbol of cheese and delis, <laughs> and um, and he was so cool. And then he was like running off to get a flight to go find caviar somewhere, and and so I never actually met him. I just edited his words. Um, so I did get to, I went to Ann Arbor last fall to do some fact checking to make sure I got that part right and we had a good time. And so, yeah, Ari's been great and I'm gonna see him in September. I'm gonna read, I think I'm gonna read At the Deli. Um, and we have a bottle of this really, um, really nice wine that Ambrosio makes. And then we, and the cheese that actually was made in this factory across the fields was, it was the same recipe, but, um, but they went out and they bought milk on the market. They sort of bastardized this beautiful cheese. And Ambrosio called this cheese, he always would call this cheese the dead cheese or the soulless cheese. And um, when he passed the factory, he would always mutter swears and curses under his breath and <laughs> cast hex signs. Um, so, so we do have a tin of this dead soulless cheese. So I, it's possible Ari and I will have some wine and cheese when I see him. And we'll complete the pilgrimage, you know, full circle. Michael, I, congratulations on the wonderful book. Thank which you. Which I finished at two in the morning. <laughs> Monday evening. All right. And awesome. Thank now you. Now it's uh, you paint some wonderful characters beyond Ambrosio, uh, and 
you have a, an incredible sense of place, and uh, finally you have a wonderful story. So, are there any talks about a making a movie? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking halfway through the question that my mom planted this. <laughs> uh, um, there, you know, okay, I, I was, um, I, last summer I was in Madrid, and I, and I did a, um, I don't do celebrity profiles, but I did my first celebrity profile with Javier Bardem, and, and we hung out, and we had a very good time, and, um, and, but I didn't, I have nothing to do with when this book comes out, I don't get involved with the movie stuff, but that, was the first person it went to, and he's sort of tentatively now very interested. Um, you know, some people here know that a yes in Hollywood is not really a yes until you know the first the first frame gets filmed. But um, but it's a per it's actually a per it would be a perfect setup for him because he just had another baby, and then he could they're back in Madrid living, and so they could go up um, to this village and film. So I think it's right now very enticing. Um, but we'll see. You know, that's a lot of this. The next question is, who would play you? Uh, R.J. Kelly. <laughs> but you might have to fight my brother for it. Um, you're better looking. Um, yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> So Carlos, a teacher here in Durian. Oh, Carlos. Um, Carlos was no. He he's a neighbor of mine in Portland, um, and he his parents um, are Colombian, so he grew up speaking Spanish. But even Carlos, uh, who has such a deep love and appreciation and understanding of the Spanish language, when he came to this village, um, was baffled. And it wasn't because it wasn't. It's very pure Castilian. Um, but it was that they used this very old vernacular. So, like the first time I met um, Ambrosio's father, you know, he, he threw out his hand and he was like, "Shake the shovel." <laughs> and then Carlos turned to me and said, "He says, shake the shovel." And I was like, what, "I don't understand what we're doing here." Um, so, so there's a lot. There was sort of a language to 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 understand, and, and especially in a village with, with um, older people, there were other denominations of money that they use. It was even before pesetas. So they would say something was worth some number of farangas and you know then it would take an hour to try to figure out what, you know, <laughs> it had cost. So there was a lot there were a lot of trans uh, it was good for me because I um, we took some Spanish courses. I think the summer we lived there I was on the verge of almost being there and I could understand a lot, but I really couldn't speak and um, at at some point as a Journalist, when I had to go back to being a journalist because I came, became very close to Ambrosio and his family became our family and we became theirs. Um, at some point, I had to separate myself from him. Uh, but all the while, with these translators who came with me, they were all friends. Um, I had this instant fact check. You know, I, I, I could, even when I did an adapted essay for the New York Times, the fact checking process is so rigorous there. And I had, you know, here are the four translators to speak to. They'll confirm all of this. And so, you know, is the story of Manuel Flying true? You know, did, was it told like this? And all these things, as a, as a journalist, it was very helpful um, because it wasn't my word against someone else's or it wasn't um, a transcript that, you know, maybe where I misinterpreted a, a phrase or something. It was these guys were, were experts at it. And I had a really clean, mostly clean translation right in the moment. So, and I never could have done that. Even if I'd spent two years learning the language, I never would have had that facility. How old is he? Uh, how old is he? He's, um, he's 56 now. But he lives hard, you know, like the way they do in the village. Their bodies are, get beaten up, and they drink, they wake up, and they have a regimen of drinking that is very social, and um, and so he's aged before me. I mean, I've aged before him, but he more than I. Um, and he said, like the, um, in November when I went to see him, he said, he's you know he's 56, but he he said, um, this is this is now his father had passed away. Um, and he said, now this is my, it's my time to prepare for my death. In spite of his deal with his, his friend, he, he wouldn't go back and try to make a little bit more of the genuine thing. To go back and make the cheese? 
Yeah, that's a great question because originally I thought, um, and I should have asked that very early on. It took me five years to ask that question because I didn't want to break the spell. And, uh, but I thought it was like a Kentucky Fried Chicken story of like Colonel Sanders' secret recipe and they had stolen the recipe. Uh, but Ambrosio could have gone back and made it. It wasn't that he, could, he didn't have access to the recipe. It was that as he signed all these contracts, he signed himself um, $3 million into debt. And he was shattered. And he was shattered and he was caught up for many years in this plot that I read to you. Um, he, was, he was lost in his grief. And he, he called this uh, loss of the cheese a death in the family. He really treated it that way. So he didn't have the spirit for it. You know, he didn't have the, the um, interest. He'd lost all interest. And his, fa uh, his, no, his brother one day, we were, so Ambrosio, this is, this is the uninterested Ambrosio. He's standing, you know, at two o'clock as usual at the bar or up at the, up at the bodega. And he's playing this little charanga, this little gourd-like instrument, singing at the top of his lungs in the middle of a big um, rollicking crowd. And he seemed like the most animated person I'd ever seen. And um, one night, uh, his brother said, "We've been trying. You know, we're we spent eight years trying to reanimate Ambrosio." I was like, "What was he like? Animate? Like by your definition? Because he was, yeah, he was incredible, unanimated." <laughs> Mike, when did you first see that this is a book? Because obviously, when you first went there, you didn't realize the gem that ultimately unfolded as you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think what happened was um, in 2000, right after my first book came out, I, um, I, was a, I was in conversations to do this book about John Walker Lind, who was the American Taliban. Um, and this was after 9-11, so it seemed like the, you know, there, was, there was a pretty big story going on in our world. And this piece of cheese seemed slightly ridiculous. Like I. I I wasn't really talking very loudly about this, um, but I was returning there. And in some ways, I was returning there because it was such an antidote to, to some of this other madness. And the other thing with that book, um, there was an offer to do the book. I, I, and I turned it down because I just could see that I was going to spend a lot of time in a war zone. And that was some of what I was doing in my magazine work anyway. So I was, I was covering the story at some level. But when I went to this place, I was um, completely uh, connected to this deeper other way. And the other thing that I found interesting at the time was this, this idea of like the American narrative had collapsed with Gitmo and these pictures from Abu Ghraib. Um, you know, this, the, the um, horrors of war as they were being covered in split second time um, gave many Americans pause and, and um, raised a lot of questions. And then here was this like Castilian legend making uh, intact and sort of beautifully told and I, I just kept waiting for it to, to maybe um, speak to me as a book so I was, I was running my tape recorder I was taking notes it wasn't just you know for the heck of it it wasn't just like let's go back up to Guzman because I've got some spare time it was I mean I was collecting like I collect all the time um, but then I realized I think I realized in 2002 like, I really want to do this. I want an excuse to come back here to this place. I want, I want to really settle into this place. Did you regard this in some way as a spiritual journey? Like showing the claim with El Camino? Uh, it became that. I mean, um, my spiritual life is a little different than hers, but I... <laughs> but, but I... But, but that idea of being on the Camino, to being on a pilgrimage, I mean, I think this is part of how we travel. We make up, you know, we make up these sideways reasons for going. I'm going to go there and I'm going to try that lobster roll. I'm going to go over here and we're going to see that beach or we're going to try that ice cream or we're going to, you know, um, see that performance. And, um, and then it's, it ends up being these adventures along the way that really are the stories and that really animate uh, the experience. So I think for me, what happened was as I, as I started to meet some of the people in the village that, who had t really turned their back on materialism. There's a guy there named Kreef. Um, he was from Basque country. His three brothers came down, so they were the shepherds. And, um, and he said at one point, I, did, I made this decision, if I wasn't a millionaire by the time I was 40, 
I, was, um, I wasn't going to do anything but make enough money to feed myself. And uh, then I was, would sculpt for the rest of my life. And that's what he's done. He's like well, really, truly one of the most fulfilled human beings I've met. Um, there's another guy who took uh, and found in ruins these old, beautiful keys. Um, and when, when the Jews were driven out of Spain, um, that sometimes they left so quickly that they left the keys in the doors. And when these buildings collapsed, these, you can find these old keys, um, you know, 400 years old. And he would take these keys and he would, he would try to replicate them. And he'd look in old books to try to replicate them. These keys couldn't, they didn't, there was no door that could be opened by these keys. But this was his, pra- this was his practice. This is what he did. And I was completely intrigued by that. I just didn't understand it at first, and then the more I understood, the more I did understand. He was connecting himself to the bigger flow of history there, and by doing so was giving himself this, this power that he had lost in, in the, um, mo- sort of the, the more modern Spain. So it reads a little like a tragedy, that he sort of sold his soul to the commercial interests, the cheese, the recipe. What's your read on that? I mean, were you portraying or writing about a guy who kind of made a mistake in life and he, and he never forgave himself? Yeah, there was... This is where it gets very complicated because in the end, I, I, I was forced to that point where in order to, to end like when to end this book, I, I really had to separate myself eventually from him and that took about five years um, or six years. And, and, um, and his narrative was... He, that he was, he would always be the righteous one because he possessed this this code, um, and because he didn't know business, because he had uh, been duped by people whose only principle was profit. So the secret to the devil. Yeah, and but so he so this was his version of it, and but he also um, collided up against this every day when these every week when these guys came to collect. You know, money. So he would have to give him a table. He'd have to give him his car. He, he was faced with his own inadequacies because he had put himself there. He had he had these ambitions. He had this dream um, that this cheese was going to like take over the world. And uh, when people ate it, they were going to be intrinsically changed, and that the world was going to be somehow this more connected place that understood its own history, rather than living in you know the the commercial breaks and interstices and all that other stuff I was talking about. Should we do, can we do two more questions? Does anybody have one? How do you characterize your relationship with him now and and maybe ongoing? So I saw him a month ago and um, this book this book was done, but I didn't have the book itself. I had a galley, and I didn't, I didn't give it to him because it, the galley still has things that, that were going to change, and I, didn't want, I, wanted him to, I wanted him to have the final. So uh, it was put in the mail to him by me, and, uh, and when I was there a month ago, he was great. There was a photographer from the New York Times who was there, so we were running around taking pictures. We had all these meals in the telling room. It was, um, as it always is, you know, incredible. And drunken and and uh, full of you know him playing his charanga at two in the morning, and and at the very end when I left to go to Madrid, um, he said what he always says to me, which is when are you coming back? Like when am I going to see you again? And I said I hope in the fall if it works out. And then I made this joke and I said if that is if if people here you know still like me after the book and. He very, very seriously, the most serious he's ever been with me, like I mean, he said, um, if people don't like your book, you best never come back. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think it kind of hit me in that moment that we had undergone a full separation. Now we, and, and this is, a, this in this moment, we're in this, this uh, sort of dynamic flux, but you know some of the some of the the byproduct of putting out a book like this is that you have um, like the this piece that ran in the Times that I can that he's read. I mean that was translated for him that he was very pleased with um, some attention in the Wall Street Journal, and I think friends around him think that maybe there would be investors who would come back because he's such an amazing front man, like he's such an amazing storyteller. Um, 
and uh, he did such a wonderful job with it the first time around. Um, if they could, you know, install somebody trustworthy who could handle the business side. So there's like cause for mild optimism, but I think when he really reads it and he really reads the end of it, um, he's going to be a little shocked at what happens there. But he orchestrated much of it himself. This may be before your time, but it almost reminds me of like of a modern brigadoon. You know, the village. It's like it's it's carved out. Everywhere. That's what my dad says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, have, do you have one more question here? Anybody? Not so much a question, but I've done this with other writers. Now that you have children, three of them, um, would you consider taking some of these tales? Oh, that's interesting. I would love to. I would love Ambrosio for Ambrosio to do a children's book because they're. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, in the book, he tells he tell I I translate two of these sort of tales. There's one about the the priest of Roa, who um, who has some problems with some donkeys and. Um, and then there's a, the Witches of Peña Fial, which is an incredible story about two hunchbacks. Um, and when these stories get told, um, there's, a, there's a basic plot line. And then uh, and this comes from the days when people were in the fields and they were killing time. What they would do was they would have the plot line and then they would, um, they would just riff. It was like playing jazz. You know, they would just go off and they would, they would do all the atmospherics. They would add all the, the you know, the wind and the moon and every every atmospheric detail they could throw on it, and um, and Ambrosio is a master at that. And he did this this story, the witches of Peña Fail. Um, he told to our kids, and they, our youngest, literally, I thought he was going to pee his pants. He was <laughs> terrified. Um, so so it would be a good. I think it would be a good collection of, of tales and fairy tales. That'd be pretty. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I want to thank you guys so much. I'm going to sign some books if you want to come up. It's a great. <laughs>